I'm Heather Marie Montia, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books, in collaboration with Georgia Public Broadcast, is pleased to host a conversation with award-winning author Tanana Reeve Dew, author of The Wishing Pool and Other Stories. PBS Books is a proud partner with the Library of Congress to promote their 2023 National Book Festival. Let's take a moment to hear from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. I'm Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress, and I want to give a thank you to PBS Books for supporting the National Book Festival. Hope you can join us in Washington and online for this year's festival on Saturday, August the 12th. Well, thank you, Dr. Hayden. If you live in traveling distance to Washington, D.C., even if you live in Georgia, don't miss the 2023 Library of Congress National Book Festival on Saturday, August 12th from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. I really encourage everyone to consider this incredible trip. The festival is free and open to everyone. The complete schedule for the various talks and events can be found at loc.gov slash bookfest. But if you can't be there in person, you can stream it live that day and curate your own experience from the comfort of your home. Well, now through August 31st, PBS Books and PBS stations across the country will host a series of 10 virtual events with 11 outstanding authors. They will be available on demand on PBS Books and the National Book Festival website at loc.gov slash bookfest. Well, here's a quick word from our station partner. Welcome, I'm Emily Hackshaw, the Vice President for Community Engagement at Georgia Public Broadcasting, and I am thrilled to be here to introduce this evening's event with award-winning author Tanana Reeve Du in celebration of the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm proud that GPB is committed to sharing the stories of contemporary authors. There is no question that books have the power to amplify people's stories, just like the Library of Congress National Book Festival theme, everyone has a story. For over two decades, the Library of Congress National Book Festival has brought huge crowds of people to DC, and we are delighted to support the Library of Congress's important work. We hope that you'll join us on a journey tonight and learn more about Tanana Reeve Du and her latest book, The Wishing Pool and Other Short Stories. Tanana Reeve uses horror to probe history, the shocking present, and the imagined future. GPB is also thrilled to partner with libraries and PBS Books. We hope that you will enjoy tonight's conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Emily. We are so happy to partner with GPB on this extraordinarily exciting event tonight. Today's conversation features Tanana Reeve Du to discuss her work and her involvement in the festival. We'll be discussing her latest book, The Wishing Pool and Other Stories, which is her second collection of stories, which include horror, science fiction, and suspense, all genres that she wields masterfully. From mysterious to magical town of Gracetown to the aftermath of the pandemic, she reaches far into the future. Dew's stories all share a sense of dread and fear balanced with heart and hope. Well, let's meet Tanana Reeve Dew. Tanana Reeve Dew is an award-winning author who teaches Black horror and Afro futurism at the University of California, Los Angeles. A leading voice in black speculative fiction for many years, Dew has received an American Book Award, an NAACP Image Award, and a British Fantasy Award. And her writing has been included in Best of the Year anthologies. Her stories have been featured on the LeVar Burton Reads podcast and by the Realm audio entertainment company. Dew and her husband collaborator, Stephen Barnes, wrote for Jordan Peele's The Twilight Zone and the Shutters anthology, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. They also co-wrote the black horror graphic novel, The Keeper, illustrated by Marco Finnegan. Dew and Barnes co-host a podcast, 
Life Writing, Write for Your Life. Her latest work, which we'll be discussing today, will be featured at the 2023 National Book Festival. Welcome to Nana Reeve. Oh, uh, thank you. So happy to be here. Oh, we are so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. You know, I always like to start these conversations to ask the author to discuss the premise of their book in their own words. If you can give a, a summary of your book for the audience. Well, uh, as you put it so well, these are basically Afrofuturism stories, which I teach at UCLA is the fiction of Black speculation, the fantasy, horror, magical realism of the Black diaspora. And horror is where my heart lives. But all of these stories are basically about characters who are dealing with the uncanny, most of them for the first time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's like, oh, the world isn't exactly what I thought and having to pivot and grow and change and confront whatever it is, sometimes menacing, sometimes just magical uh, stories, centering Black characters. So there are 14 short stories within, within your book. Um, I know you started writing some of these stories a long time ago. Yeah. And so could you talk a little bit about what inspired you to go back to these stories and, and really, why now? Why is this book being published now at this moment? That's actually a great question. And it's, it's almost an accident in the sense that over the past, I'd say, 10 years in particular, I was working on a novel that's coming out later this year, The Reformatory. And I was trying to create a career for myself in screenwriting. I wrote an episode of The Twilight Zone with my husband, Steve, and wrote some episodes of a Black anthology series called Horror Noir. But... In between that, editors would reach out to me and say, hey, we're doing a themed anthology. Could you write a story about X? Um, one of the stories in this collection is, is told from the point of view of a monstrous character. Um, some of them are futuristic. Often I didn't get a lot of direction. And it's interesting that I did gravitate toward pandemic stories, although with the exception of the very last story, the biographer, all of my pandemic stories were written before COVID. And um, that, that's an interesting coincidence, but the horror writer in me, I guess, has always been a little bit afraid of pandemics. And what I would do is if I didn't have an idea ready, which I often didn't, I would just look at what's scaring you right now? Like even something as simple as a fungus growing in the shower, which was really the nugget of a story. One of my favorite stories in this collection called Rumpus Room is like, what does this fungus mean? <laughs> and it's gross, but it's not just that it's gross. How can you create a story around something that scares you or intrigues you? Well, you know, it's it's funny because I um, read all the books that um, when when we discuss, you know, who who we're going to feature in the show. And I will say I was at first I, I get really I get scared very easily. And so I was nervous to, to jump into your book because I was like, oh, my gosh, what if I have nightmares? But, um, but I was OK. And it took me on this journey. The pandemic ones did a little bit make me nervous just because you know, because of who I am and also how I grew up. So, but um, I think that you've done an outstanding job really putting this collection together and having, and having this balance. Um, okay, so you say most of the stories are a different version of you in your intro. And you also talk about how they conjure answers to questions that you can only confront through these stories. What do you mean by this? I think a great example of that would be the titular story, The Wishing Pool, because I was asked to submit a short story. Yet again, I did not have a story in mind. The deadline was approaching. <laughs> and I was like, well, what's scaring you right now? And this was a couple of years into COVID, maybe a year and a half into COVID. And I had not seen my aging father throughout the pandemic. And I had a visit scheduled to see him for the first time. So this story was a way of projecting my fears forward. Like what if my father has changed a lot? What if, you know, the worst happens and maybe he doesn't know you anymore? All these kinds of things go through your mind when you're confronting an aging relative, especially when you're far away. And I put all of that into that story, the wishing pool as a way both of visualizing those fears, 
but also to contextualize those fears, because I don't want to give away the story. It is one of the, I mean, some readers find it one of the scariest stories, especially if they're dealing with an aging parent. I don't think it's a great ending for the protagonist, but I, I think it's an okay ending for the father. Yeah, I I wanted to ask if there was actually a pool in your when you were no. growing up. Heck no. <laughs> well, really, where is it? <laughs> no, but my parents moved to rural Florida, which is where a lot of my Gracetown stories come from. My mother was born in Quincy, Florida. My mother, Patricia Stevens, do was born in Quincy, Florida, and after they moved to this five-acre tract that was bordering the woods. One of the grandchildren asked, why did grandma and grandpa live in the woods? <laughs> so I grew up in the suburbs. I had never lived in a wooded environment. So those visits to my parents were very fruitful for me in terms of imagining what if you had grown up here and looking out in sort of the spooky wilds of the uh, untamed woods just beyond their fence and all kinds of animals would wander under their property. So as a writer, I was all over that. And it was very easy to imagine that there could have been a wishing pool and a friend I had made in this sort of remote location. It's a great story. And there is a, I, I always like the twist you put at the end. Um, but I will say as someone who has parents who are getting older, yeah, it's it's it struck home and it made me think, right? And also appreciate where I am at the moment. And I think that's the other thing um, that your stories do is they really help the reader to look inside themselves and look at their experiences. And you do a really good job because your character development, you do such a, like Joya is such a, is developed so well and you you get in her head and, and, and it's short. And that's the other thing I love about this is that, for people like me who are, I have three kids, I'm super busy. Your stories are bite-sized gems <laughs> and you can oh, read one you. <laughs> and then you like on to the next thing, but then you can read what, right? Like, and it's, for me, that's, it's a real gift. <laughs> I don't know if I should say this, but when I, when I gift copies of The Wishing Pool to people I know, I say, just stick it in your bathroom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> read it a little bit at a time, one sitting at a time. <laughs> That is very funny. <laughs> um, so your book is divided into four parts. Can you discuss those four categories? I mean, it's the wishes, Gracetown, the, um, Na is it Naima story? Yeah, the, well, I have to refer yeah, to the table of contents myself because, you know, I did not write the book thinking I had a sense of organization. So it's uh, wishes, it's the Gracetown stories, it's the Naima stories, you're absolutely right and future shock. And because this was unplanned, there was just one day I realized, oh, I have enough new stories for a collection. I, I published a previous collection, Go Summer, in 2015, which is when I first introduced my magical town of Gracetown. In, in my fiction, I first introduced the Naima character in my first collection. So some of them were continuing characters and continuing settings. But as I looked at all the stories, and there were some contemporary realism stories that did not make it into the collection, although I might have alluded to them in my, my notes. <laughs> um, so Wishes is really more just um, sort of the magical horror stories. Um, uh, Gracetown stories are specifically set in the fictitious town that I came up with after visiting my parents when they moved to rural Florida. You know, when I was in college, I read a lot of Faulkner and a lot of his stories took place in this fictitious county, Yachnipatawpha County. And uh, some reviewers think it's my, my dairy, which is Stephen King, and I will receive that or my, or, you know, uh, one of Stephen King's fictitious towns. But really it was Faulkner who inspired me to sort of look at what would it be like if you had this sort of fictitious town where magical things happen sometimes bad magical things and where children see ghosts or children are more likely to see ghosts. Children are more likely to interact with these magical elements. And it's this kind of thing where as you get older, you sort of outgrow it. So the Gracetown stories, um, my only real racism as the monster story is in that Gracetown section. It's called Last Stop on Route 9. And the rest of them are just various versions of weird things <laughs> that happen in this town of Gracetown. The Naima stories are specifically my play stories, but unlike when she first appeared in my first collection, Go Summer, that was sort of leading up to, 
the pandemic and like right as it's hitting, these stories take place after the pandemic, in some cases long after. Uh, attachment disorder, she's a, a much older woman. And in the first Naima story, which is also one of my favorites, which is about this question of just because we're living right after a pandemic and the entire road is blocked with cars full of corpses and we're afraid to interact with each other, doesn't mean I can't throw a stand-up comedy show. <laughs> You know? And and to me, that kind of mirrored my journey through COVID because my two coping mechanisms are horror and comedy. And I mean, almost on a daily basis, I love to watch either a horror series or a horror movie. And I love to listen to stand up comedy. I, I did an open mic night in stand up when I was in my 20s at Coconuts Comedy Club in Miami. Oh. And I just did not pursue that path because I wanted to put everything into being a writer. And I was almost superstitious. I love music too, but it's like, no, it's all going to be fiction. I'm not going to distract myself with anything else. But deep down, a part of me always did want to do stand up. So I thought, wouldn't it be great? to give this character Naima, who has been through so much, <laughs> who has been through so much, give her one day, one day only, when she can do something she's always wanted to do, draw out these survivors in a way that they've never gathered before because they're so avoiding each other and return to like something that feels like normalcy. And I heard some podcasters yesterday talking about how that story reminded them of what it felt like after COVID to go back out and be around people. You know, it's something that that we miss. Well, and I appreciate that as well, because I think um, that transition was hard and it still continues to be hard. I mean, I, I, um, I spoke to someone recently um, and they said, you know, I haven't been out since COVID. And I, I just thought, wow. Right. And they were an older person. And, but everyone is re-entering the, the world at their own time, at their own moment. And it certainly has been hard on the elderly. Um, and, yeah. and so those conversations always remind me of that. But yes, I think um, your story has also helped help, help to bring that to the forefront as well. Um, so one of the stories that I I enjoyed, um, I was thinking actually in seventh grade, I remember watching an Alfred Hitchcock, The Twilight Zone in nearly every English class. Now, memory and perception are two different things as your stories also explore. Um, so it maybe wasn't every English class, but it seemed that way. And <laughs> um, I felt like the last stop on, on Route 9, it, it, it seemed like Twilight Story to me very much. And mm. I wanted to know kind of, you know, how did you come up with with the premise and, and Charlotte? Um, and uh, just if you could talk a little bit about it, because sure. it, it really, to me, it felt like even the fog, you know, all of it. Well, it's funny you like that one. That's one of the scariest stories in the collection. It might, you know, um, so I'm glad that it didn't scare you too much. And I, I love talking about this story for a couple different reasons. First of all, just quick background. I published a short story called Last Stop on Route 9 when I was in college. It might have been my first short story published in, in, in a literary magazine. But that was during a time when because of my exposure to canon and the reading I was doing and the training I was getting, I had grown away from writing black protagonists, little black girl protagonists that I had started writing in elementary school. And by the time I graduated from college, I was writing white male protagonists, not by conscious even choice, not even thinking, oh, my work will sell better if I do this. I would almost feel more at ease with that decision. It was really just because to me, that was what a story felt like. A story, a short story, was a story about a white man or occasionally a white woman having a moment of epiphany. Was the training, I had these MFA style English workshops and horror had also been wrung out of me by that time too. Not anyone saying don't do it, but again, just because that was what we were exposed to, that was what we were reading, those were the successful authors. So that first story that I wrote in my, uh, maybe like at 19, 20, 21, was about a white man <laughs> on a road trip who stops at a gas station and we realize he's sick. And that was the whole story. Like he's dying. That's the whole point. 
And last stop on Route 9 has that double meaning. Like, it's not just the gas station. Get it? He's dying. So as I, again, was facing a deadline for an anthology, I thought, you know what? I want to revisit and reclaim that story. And I'm going to be in conversation with that younger writer I was and show her how I can express myself through fiction in a way that includes both me as a Black woman and my love for horror. And I'm going to go all out in a racism is the monster story. And unfortunately, part of it is based on a true incident, just a small part. When my husband and I were on our way from my mother, my late mother's funeral to a house in rural Florida, we got lost on one of these little two lane roads where there's nothing but fields on one side and you know, just shacks on the other, just in the middle of nowhere. The GPS is like, good luck. You know, there's nothing out there. You lose the cell phone, you lose the GPS. And we finally saw a driveway and we said, hey, we're going to stop and ask for directions. But as we were ready to pull into the driveway and it was a compound, there were several buildings. So it's like, oh, thank goodness, civilization. Well, not so fast because we noticed a giant flagpole flying a huge Confederate flag. And so our impulse then was like, ah, and to go into reverse and not ask for directions. So that stuck with me. I was like, okay, take that incident, dial it up to 11. And what does that feel like when you're lost and you're vulnerable? And unfortunately, there have been several stories in the news lately about Black people, even a Black child knocking on a door, a boss, or knocking on a neighbor's door for whatever reason, and they get shot and killed. So the horror is real. The horror is a lived experience and a fear that even I would have to this day if I were in an unfamiliar neighborhood, especially a very rural setting where there are no other people around. Of course, I would hesitate to knock on a stranger's door, not knowing how they would perceive me or how they would greet me. Um, but I, I made it. And I think maybe if there's a Twilight Zone feel, it's because so much of that series is about sort of peeling back the layers of our world to show something that is just on the other side of realism, something that's just a little bit out of sync. So when they pass through this fog bank in the story, they're passing from our world into this nether region in Gracetown history where anger is still boiling over and will attack them. And I threw in everything that scared me in that story, knocking on a stranger's door, dogs chasing you. <laughs> Because you know, I have a grand dog now, so I've become a, a dog lover late, late, late in life. But my first experiences with dogs were not pleasant. And dogs in civil rights history were weaponized against protesters like my parents, uh, especially German shepherds, which to a degree I'm still a little afraid of, to be honest, just because of that association. Um, but, but yeah, I threw everything I was afraid of into that story. Well, and you also, even in terms of the difference between Charlotte and Kai, who, you know, she has him hide. He's he's 12, right? But he looks like a man already in some ways. And I, and I think those, um, as I was reading it, I, I did feel the, the reality, right? that realism of, of that situation and also the recognition of, of, the thoughtfulness be and Charlotte is young. She's what, 21 years yeah, old. She's like 21 or 22. She's not quite old enough to be a parent, but she's now finding herself in charge of her young cousin at a time when they have unexpectedly now come across danger. And that's one of the, the things that's also very frightening in life when, when you're just, you're on a vacation, you're just minding your business and it just takes one small thing to fall out of place. Like you've run out of gas or you don't have cell service and all of a sudden something that seems so innocuous takes on this menacing turn and she's responsible for this child who, by the way, like a lot of children in horror, is very attuned to everything that's wrong and tries to tell her at every step, why are you doing that? No, don't do that. <laughs> and, and, um, you know, I, I feel so sorry for children in horror movies because I will tell you, I don't care how young my son was. If he told me there was like something moving around and he heard a noise in his closet, I would take that seriously. I would investigate that. And, and I wanted to write a story where she would figure out, oh, this kid actually knows what he's talking about. I mean, even I, I will say, and it's probably my own personal issues, but 
but you have her concerned about dents she's putting on her rental car, right? Like that's me. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, did someone like knock into my, you know, or did, yeah. I, did I dent this or like, just like a little scratch, like, and she's worried about that. Meanwhile, her life is like, you know, things are crumbling around her. She's like, wait, is there like a little nick on my, you know, my hubcap? <laughs> right? like, exactly. So, you don't want to get fined or charged so, for that. <laughs> um, you know, and, and just even their solution to that. I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to, and no, no spoilers here, but um, I, I just thought it was so craftily done because it, it did bring in so many of these important issues of race identity loss, right? Because they're, they're um, supposed to be gathering and they just experienced a funeral of their grandfather yeah. and are supposed to be gathering together as a family and they're, they got lost on the way. And so I also think even that because the I feel like the gathering after funerals is often a space for healing too. So you kind of, you really layered it in there. I You're have isolated from that. And I'm glad you honed in on the grief piece because in, in horror in general, the entry points to whatever the monstrous or the uncanny is usually comes from either trauma or, or you've done something you shouldn't have done. Mm. you you yeah you've crossed some kind of line and you saw that all the time in like 80 slasher films if anyone who smokes a cigarette or has sex is going to get murdered by the serial killer <laughs> but in this story it is grief that kind of opens that doorway not I mean there's a transgression I won't go into it it's an accidental transgression but mostly it's grief and I think grief is so effective in horror because for so many of us grief is the first horror we experience it, it, the, the loss of someone, a grandparent, even a great grandparent. I had a relationship with my great grandmother. We wrote letters. She told me family history. So when someone is there and then they're not, on some level, we can't wrap our minds around that. And it's such a horrible feeling in our bodies. It's a physical, stomach achy, migrainey, horrible, horrible feeling. We have it over the loss of a pet or the loss of a loved uh, human. It's the same emotion, just in degrees. So the way the world rips apart when we experience a loss is is part of also what I wanted to express in that story, Last Stop Around Nine. Well, I want to just remind the audience, if you are just joining us, you are watching PBS Books. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and I am fortunate to be here today with Tanana Reeve Du, and we are discussing her latest book, The Wishing Pool and Other Stories. Back to the conversation. So um, can we discuss another story? Uh, I love to. Haunt in the Window. Um, oh, and paint, it's, paint in the Window. Sorry, Haunt yeah. in the Window. Um, if we could discuss what inspired that story, because there was also a lot in that story. Um, and if you could maybe talk a little bit about the story and the inspiration. I would I would love to talk about that story um, because it's, it's actually very special to me. It was part of uh, an anthology called um, South Central Noir, edited by Gary Phillips. And I don't live in South Central LA, but I do live in Southern California. And I used to go very regularly to a bookstore called Esawan Books in Lamar Park, which was one of the inspirations for that story. I was also thinking about Marcus Bookstore in Oakland, which was very supportive of me, especially very early in my career. And these booksellers who are just pillars in their community, you walk in off the street, they recommend personally, that you should read this or you should read that. It's called hand selling and book selling. And it's so, so important to my development, especially again, as a young writer. And, you know, SO1 Books is closed now. And I think at the time I wrote the story, I'd heard they were closing or maybe I just sort of sensed it in the wind. I think if I had known for sure they were closing, I would have specifically dedicated the story to that store. But anyone who knows LA probably knows what store I was talking about. And part of what's happening in that area and, and a lot of other um, urban areas is that you have gentrification, which is, you know, wealthier people often who are, who are white or don't look like the other residents in the neighborhood, although not always, but often. And all of a sudden, the landlords who couldn't make repairs are fixing up their buildings and raising their rents and the little uh, community oriented stores start to shut down and bigger chains move in and there's a Whole Foods or whatever. And what happens is the black residents become othered 
in their own community. I remember hearing about someone who was shot at like a, a mall, you know, in Baldwin Hills. And I'm thinking, what? Uh, by, by, by a security guard or a police officer, which to me speaks to that sort of uneasy relationship that new people have when they encounter the old residents, because, you know, a lot of our cultural imprinting has been that dark skin is something to fear. It's a message that we hear pounded again and again during political seasons from the, the right. The brown people are going to hurt you. The black people are going to rob you. You know, just playing on fears is it never loses. It's, it's, a, it's a good strategy. And it's something that a lot of people feel, you know, even Barack Obama in, in one of his books wrote about watching his own grandmother move away from a black man who walked into the elevator. It's just so deeply ingrained. Of course, you know, is she racist? Was she racist according to the way we would, would call racism now? No, not, I mean, she loved, I, I would imagine not, but it's just such a deeply ingrained fear of the other that has been perpetuated in the media. So this story takes a terrible turn because this bookseller who's been in this community for years since he was in high school volunteering and has worked his way up now to manager um, is experiencing the change right in front of him, not just in terms of what his customers want to buy, but in terms of how he's treated by the security guards at his own store. And throughout this story right he he changes himself but he has similar to the to the story we were speaking about a moment ago there he had this real feeling in him about so, the security guard right and i think yes. that the but yet the, your story takes us on really i want to say like a self exploration or finding a self discovery um of daryl in a lot mm. of ways do you, yeah, do you he's experiencing the haunting of, or the haints, you know, that's sort of an old timey uh, way to dis describe a ghost would be a haint. But he's experiencing this haunting and he's trying to confront it. But like, as you say, he's learning about himself in the process of trying to figure out who's haunting his store. And I won't spoil who is actually haunting his store in the end, but um, it's one of those twist endings. It certainly is. Is there another story that you'd like to share a little bit about? Sure. My longest story in here is a novelette. Actually, uh, when when I when I when I sold this book, my editor asked me to write three new stories, <laughs> and that was maybe the hardest part. So one of them was the biographer, which again was reclaiming an idea I had when I was a younger writer and never could figure out what to do with it. I think I was too young. I needed to be able to look back on my life a little bit. To, to really understand that story. But the other one was Rumpus Room, which turned out to be way longer and it was so long that I didn't have to write three, I only had to write two. And it was maybe the toughest story because it was swirling around in my head for the longest time. I did find this disgusting looking fungus and I wear glasses typically. So when I was in the shower and I have very bad vision, I just saw this, this dark spot kind of in the corner. I thought maybe a washcloth had fallen. So I nudged it with my foot, but it was hard. And it's like, Ugh, that Ugh feeling never went away. <laughs> I never understood how did it grow so fast? Where is it even coming from? How did it get through this crack? <laughs> so this real life um, concern, because it almost did feel supernatural the way it appeared. I, I went through my formula. I, I hate to use the word formula, but I have an approach. Let me say my approach to creating a short story would be, okay, you take that thing in real life that scared you, which in this case was this fungus, and you amplify that so that it's way bigger than just a fungus. It, it means something. It is a message of some kind. You find the protagonist who is the best person to experience a relationship with the strange fungus and, a, and, and what is the experience you know, why is she here? Where is she? And this was one of those stories where I used transgression. So she has suffered a loss. She's lost custody of her daughter. That's, I don't think that's too much of a spoiler. The very first line of the story is I broke my daughter's arm. So she has temporarily lost custody of her daughter because she accidentally, in her mind, broke her daughter's arm. So there's the transgression uh, and, and, and also grief because she misses her daughter and she doesn't believe she's the kind of person that this judge has characterized 
her as. So this woman who's full of um, these feelings of grief and guilt and shame is thrust into a situation where she moves into a rumpus room, like a stranger offers her a job and lodging and she decides to take it in this rumpus room. And that's where she sees the fungus. And I won't talk more about it, but the unraveling of this story is, is not just figuring out what the fungus means and is there a ghost or, or all these kinds of questions she has, and, but it's also who am I? And what have I done? And why did I do it? Kind of like, like you said, sitting with herself. And the two things are directly related. She can't solve her external issues until she looks at her internal issues, which frankly is the way it is in real life as yeah. well. When we want to move from one level to the other, we have to stop and examine why do we do the things we do? Why have we made the mistakes we've made so that we can improve and evolve and move forward? Okay, so since we're here, how did you move from, you know, canon, influenced by the canon after school, to the writer you are today, which has black and brown protagonists? I, I have to give a lot of credit in terms of the horror piece. I'll start with that because I was also wrung out of me to my late mother, Patricia Stevens Dew, who was a civil rights activist. She's leading the march on the image behind me if the audience can see it. In the memoir, we, we co-wrote Freedom in the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. And she came out of the civil rights era having been tear gassed, like literally a police officer threw a tear gas canister into her face. So she had a sensitivity to light for the whole rest of her life, this very visible scar from the civil rights era and a lot of fear and anger left over from that era and also watching the, the games rolled back. But despite all that, despite the fact that she and my father um, are both in the Florida Civil Rights Hall of Fame and I could look her up in the index in my college history books and she had this very you know respected uh, reputation. She loved horror. She loved horror movies. She loved horror books. So she gave me my first Stephen King novel, The Shining, when I was 16. And in some ways, coming back to horror might have been the easier part, right? Uh, because I was sort of churning my wheels, writing non-horror, contemporary realism, epiphany stories. In terms of seeing myself as a Black woman and giving myself permission to write Black and Brown characters, the first breakthrough was Gloria Naylor's Mama Day. Because Gloria Naylor was such a respected writer, but Mama Day also has elements of the metaphysical so there was this great bridge where I could see, oh, I can be respected as a writer. And also I can, I can um, look at my history. I can look at my lived experiences as a black woman and I can put myself in my stories. And it was a slow process. My first horror novel, The Between, I was moving toward myself, but I wrote a black male protagonist instead of a woman. I was still sort of writing the other in some ways, you know? I mean, there are a lot of things about my life that were in the between growing up in, in the suburbs and having active parents in the community and the kind of disagreements they would have about time spent outside trying to change the world as opposed to inside, <laughs> trying to like be a part of this family. So all that tension that you find in activist families. But it was, I would have to really credit um, Gloria Naylor. And then also I think of Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. Um, and Beloved, too. I did not discover Octavia Butler until later. I discovered her because of a friend's suggestion when I was halfway through my second novel. And in so many ways, I wish if I had just read some Octavia Butler while I was in college, I could have focused my writing a, a lot faster. I wouldn't have had to like sort of work my way through the weeds for so long. And, and what I mean by that is... Any writer is going to write their best work when they go deep into themselves and their own experiences. I mean, you might be a science fiction writer and everyone's an alien and it's metaphor, but trying to write for the marketplace, which is unconsciously what I think I was doing, right? If, if the best selling writers are white men and white women, <laughs> you know, unconsciously, maybe I was trying to aim toward market. But it was there was also this invisibility. So writers like Octavia Butler and Toni Morrison and Gloria Naylor were these sort of beacons telling me, no, you can put yourself, your history and your experiences in these stories and it's okay. 
And I think what's especially important for horror readers to understand and writers to understand is that novelty is what draws us to these stories. Mm -hmm. You can only watch so many horror movies that are like the family moves into the abandoned kit cabin and they're hearing noises. Hello. I mean, I do love that. And I will watch every single one of those. But what makes one stand out from the other is the depth of the backstory that brought the family there, what they're working through as they're dealing with the supernatural and how they respond to it. And to me as a writer, and maybe this is what appealed to my, my, my late mother was whether or not a character survives in horror. The point to me is that they confront and accept the uncanny element they're dealing with, which when you look at COVID denial, for example, so many people cannot confront and accept the scary thing. So learning how to confront and accept the scary thing is super important because that helps you come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. And when you come up with a plan, you can face it down. Not before. You have to have the plan. You have to have the acceptance, the plan, the facing down. And the facing down is the point. Um, like the end of the, the Gray, that movie with Liam Neeson. I mean, not to give away the ending, but it's just his eyes and the fight in his eyes. That's the whole point of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question then. Why is the book dedicated to your father? Well, you know, it's interesting. During the early part of my life, my mother was my biggest cheerleader, um, the horror fan, giving me the writer's market, which before the internet was the way you knew all the markets from the time I was in high school, maybe even junior high school. But she passed away in 2012. And after that time, I found, I would say, almost unexpected friendship with my father. My father had always loved him and he was always in the house. Uh, he slept there. But as a civil rights attorney and working for the Community Relations Board in, in Miami, he was always out as a community organizer. And that was, that was his bliss, was trying to create a better world. And a lot of that responsibility for child rearing fell on my mother's shoulders. So we had more of a friendship with my mother and my father was kind of this more remote figure who was always writing on his legal pads and I did steal those and I wrote on them too. But after my mother passed away and his community work started to, to you know, dwindle a bit, we saw each other and have gotten to know each other. And it's one of the great joys of my life that I still have my father at the age of 88. And um, because the wishing pool the story specifically was written in preparation to, to visit him. It felt only fitting that I should dedicate the book to my father. Thank you. Um, well, we are partnering with GPB for, for this conversation tonight. Do you have connections to Georgia? Absolutely. I spend a lot of time in Georgia. My, my father still lives in the Sandy Springs area with my sister. I lived there in Smyrna. Boy, I wish I'd held on to that house. Those prices have gone up <laughs> since they built the stadium. But I also taught at Spelman College for three years. So I do have connections to Georgia. And um, yeah, I, I, I enjoy going to, to see my father there. So those connections are, are live. So you've already received a lot of um, recognition for this book. You've been invited to the Library of Congress National Book Festival, which starts on, uh, which is on August 12th. Will we see you there? Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it. From what I understand, I'll be um, with Grady Hendrix talking about things that are scary that aren't just haunted houses. So uh, that should be fun. That's really exciting. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about any upcoming projects, things that we can expect to see from you. Absolutely. One of the reasons I wrote so many short stories and haven't published a novel in more than 10 years, I think, is because I was working on a book called The Reformatory, which is a historical horror story set in 1950. And it's also in that magical town of Gracetown where people see Haints. And it's basically the story of a 12 year old boy who gets sent to a juvenile facility called the Reformatory. It's based on the Dozier School for Boys in Mariana, Florida, which if you look it up, was a horrific facility and my great uncle died there in the 1930s. So I really wrote this book as a way to repair history and give Robert Stevens a different story where he's dealing with ghosts and also monstrous people inside the Reformatory while his teenage sister is trying to work through the criminal justice system of the 1950s to try to get him out. 
So it's about the past, but the problems with the criminal justice system have endured. So it's really also about the present. Well, I look forward to hopefully having you back when that comes out this fall. That would be great. <laughs> Well, thank you so very much for taking the time to talk to us about your book and all of your stories and for your creative sharing about your creative process, giving us some insight into how you go about your writing. I know people always value those little tips and to get inside like how they can write too. So thank you so much for your- Thank you so much. And I am so- It's just, it's brilliant and it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed the wishing pool. Well, thank you. Well, for everyone out there, I just want to remind you that the Library of Congress National Book Festival is on August 12th from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. It is free and open to the public and it is in Washington, D.C. So please go. Um, we also are part of we are doing a series of 11 of these or 10 of these and um, they started a few weeks ago and will be continuing through August 31st. The content is all available online at pbsbooks.org, also on our Facebook channel and you can also learn more at loc.gov slash bookfest. Well this has been an incredible time and I'm so glad you could you could join me. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla and happy reading.